This is AUGforums.com Real Talk. First, thank you to our sponsors, APS Payments, Kenzium, and Belixo. You can learn more about how our and Belixo. You can learn more about how our sponsors work with Acumatica by going to AUGforums.com slash sponsors. My name is Tim Rodman, and I'm coming to you live on Thursday, August 20th, 2020, from Long Beach, California. This is episode number 21, Acumatica MVP, Harsha. Harsha, you're going to have to help me pronounce your last name. <laughs> uh, Harsha's journey from legacy Everest ERP to modern Acumatica cloud ERP and the world of plugin. So with that mouthful of a title, Harsha, I'll turn it over to you to help us help me pronounce your last name and, and introduce yourself. All right. Thanks, Tim. Um, I appreciate you doing this. Um, it's a wonderful forum that you have started uh, to engage customers and partners uh, and, and developers on, on your forum. So my name is uh, Harsha Sarjapur. Um, so I'm with InfoSourcing Inc. Um, and we are Acumatica certified partner and ISV solution provider. Uh, as, as Tim mentioned, we do a little bit of plugins, uh, which kind of make us uh, kind of be in both spots as a partner as well as a, as an ISV solution provider, uh, trying to help Acumatica and uh, the customers. Um, so talking a little bit about us, um, uh, Tim, do you want me to just jump into that and just go through? Yeah, maybe what? before we get into the Acumatica side of things, maybe you could give us a little bit about your personal career background before you even got involved with Acumatica. Well, beautiful. Um, you know, we are here during COVID times, right? Uh, so let me take you back <laughs> 20, 24 years ago when life was great. <laughs> yes, that would be great. So let's flash back before COVID. Before COVID. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I started out way back uh, again in Bangalore, India. Um, so that's where I, my hometown. Um, so, uh, so I was a Fox Pro developer back in the days in 1995, right? When time was beautiful, when we had a new Windows 95 that ro rolled out, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, that's that's when I, uh, you know, I started programming and um, switched from uh, you know Fox Pro development to visual developments with Visual Basic and C++ and all the way to C Sharp, right? I just fast forwarded. Um, and then um, during this course of, you know, kind of development as a developer, um, did, did few warehouse management solution for a company out in Kenya. Uh, so I did two visits to Nairobi and Mombasa, it's a great place back then. Um, and uh, Kind of Nairobi and Mombasa is a great place back then. Um, and uh, kind of one led to another and um, I ended up with uh, iCode, which is the ERP solution provider out of uh, Virginia, right? So that's how everything started. Um, so I joined them in 1998 and uh, they were building, uh, you know, ERP solution for small and medium businesses. Uh, it was called Acquire. Uh, homegrown solution turned later on into uh, an ERP. Um, so that's where we, we kind of joined in there and they wanted to build an e-commerce integration just like Amazon, right? So that was a that was a really good project that I worked on. Uh, we came up with a prototype called iShop, um, so which we were able to connect in real time to the database and be able to show catalog and check out and place order. And then we quickly turned that around and we created the first Acquire online. Well, um, it really synced into customers. Uh, people were buying the software left and right and uh, everything was looking great uh, till, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we came up till 20, 2004. So until then I was working there as, uh, as a product manager, managing the e-commerce module and add-ons. Uh, so I come with that ERP experience uh, and I've seen the whole in a software development life cycle that goes through the ERP development, right? Starting all the way from developer, going through all the way and working through uh, to the top of product management where you really sit there and listen to uh, customers and, and partners and what their requirements are and you know how do you translate that to technical specs versus functional and then what features can be added, when it's gonna go out, what release notes 
can be done and how the support works and how the sales is engaged, how sales sometimes over, oversell and undersell uh, and, and all the difficulties that you go through, right? And then we, we in fact undersell uh, and, and all the difficulties that you go through, right? And then we, we in fact had a forum, which I, I, I mentioned to you before, um, you know, I used to manage the Everest forums. So uh, I, I go through the pains that you go through today. <laughs> so. Uh, so this was was my experience dealing with um, ERP uh, and ERP customers. Um, so since I stepped out of, uh, out of Everest um, in 2004, um, then we started out info sourcing, right? That's the company that me and my partner started out. Uh, primarily, we started out as a documentation outsourcing company and uh, outsourcing in general. And uh, we did a couple of good projects for, uh, you know, California company based companies. Um, I'm not going to use some names, but uh, we did good outsourcing projects and then slowly I switched back to uh, ERP again, uh, helping uh, you know, primarily Everest customers, um, especially in the e commerce, um, um, especially in the e commerce um, space, because I had a pretty good handle on the e commerce. Um, so you know, we kind of customized e-commerce websites, SEO, SEO was great back in the days, search engine optimization. Um, I in fact had a patent uh, pending on SEO from Everest point of it. So it really was, uh, you know, streamlined towards those those customers. Um, and then kind of sat there and I was thinking through, oh, why not I be a reseller, right? And then I kind of uh, went ahead and, uh, uh, joined hands with uh, Connected Business, which was called Enterprise Suite back in the days, uh, a California-based company, uh, and they're still in business. Uh, they were pretty much like Everest, uh, a hybrid solution, and I would say. It's a desktop application with uh, web services in the back. Um, so it was not fully cloud, um, so we kind of were able to sell that uh, and resell that as well as uh, implement, customize, and on that platform um, who are still using the system. Um, so we sold that starting from 2007 all the way till 2012. Um, and that's pretty much a flashback of who I am and uh, where, you know, where we come from in terms of the ERP experience uh, until I, you know, uh, kind of encountered Acumatica. That's excellent. Uh, I'm curious then, um, wh where did you first hear about, or how did you first hear about Acumatica? what year was that well um <laughs> going back in time again uh if you know akimarika some of the folks that were working there um we used to work together back at everest so as ali johnny and dinesh and few and sean and few other guys uh left uh everest i uh, probably in 2008 or 2009 i'm not sure of the, of the dates but uh, Ali joined uh, maybe in 2010 or even earlier, but then 2010 onwards, uh, I kept track of this upcoming ERP software company. I think they were called Project X for that reason. Um, and I think they were in Maryland uh, and then they moved to McLean uh, in Virginia. And uh, I kept an eye on it and a tab on it and said, you know, what would they be building? Um, and, and I was curious to see what other software it, it would come out. <laughs> Um, and 2012, late 2012, uh, it looked pretty promising. It was version 4.0 and I was like, okay, great. And, and they're selling it as a SaaS. I was like, wow, that's interesting. Uh, and in 2013, um, Dinesh reached out to me, who was my partner account manager then. Um, uh, then we kind of knew each other, right? So uh, he said, oh, this is really good software. And Ali also, and uh, knowing Ali was there and Sean was there by then. Um, so it really helped me to say, okay, we are back back to get together again as a team, right? So we signed up as a reseller. And uh, that year, the Acumatica Summit happened right here in Virginia, um, literally like 10 miles away from my place. Um, so I attended the summit and uh, it was looking very promising. Um, and, and, and I was able to meet, uh, you know, the Acumatica folks, especially the CTO and you know, all the other developers. And I kind of was able to see through it that this is not a product and it was a platform. And that's what really caught on to me saying, this is exactly how one should have built it. Um, you know, wish the technology was there back when we were developing. So I was really excited about that. And uh, that's how um, we really jumped into Acumatica. So yeah, 2010. Awesome. 
Yes, yeah, so you were there early on. I mean, compared to most people, I think I actually first met you at, at the Acumatica Summit in 2016 in Orlando, right. which was also seen in Orlando, right. which was also, I think, the first uh, summit as we would think of them now. You know, in terms of having a big stage and everything. Um, so you, cool. You've seen a lot uh, compared to most people in the Acumatica world. Yeah, I mean, I would say probably I'm. In the top hundred, <laughs> I would say, because there were actually um, more partners uh, like PC Bennett and and uh, you know AIM Solutions, and they were all there. Um, when I attended the first summit, I was saying, "Wow, they were getting these awards, saying you know the best resellers." And I was like, "Wow, great!" So <laughs> yes, uh, so there were a few ahead of us, and um, uh, I kept a kind of a tab on it, but I really didn't jump into it. And I think we in 2013 when we signed up. Um, we right away got an Everest customer who wanted to migrate out of Everest. Um, so we worked with uh, M3 Technologies um, and we switched them over to Acumatica, migrate out of Everest. Um, so we worked with uh, M3 Technologies um, and we switched them over to Acumatica mm -hmm. in, uh, in 2013. So that was a great, great thing for us as well as for them because we were able to dive deep into Acumatica at that point and figure out the gaps that were still there in the system uh, and i'll talk more about the plugins uh, down the road um, and then how we are able to utilize this platform so definitely yes uh, out of probably what i attended six acumatica summits uh, till now uh, so maybe i missed one when they changed from being in the mid of the year to january right when they switched that over i didn't attend that first january acumatica summit so other than that um, uh, since I signed up, um, I have attended pretty much six or seven Acumatica summits. And coming from that developer background and to your point that you being a platform and not just an application, right. uh, maybe maybe talk a little bit about when you say the word plugin, I think that's your, your current mm -hmm. word for that. Um, I think you've developed a number of plugins. Maybe first thing I'm curious about is what, what do you call a plugin versus a customization? Uh, right. Maybe you could draw a line between those. Perfect. No, great. You asked that question. So, you know, let me go walk a little uh, one step up. Uh, differentiation between product and a platform, right? Acumatica is a product, but built on a platform. Uh, so that's, that's something it resonates with me and the way they did that. Uh, a product would be more like, let's say, off the shelf. You know, I want to buy QuickBooks off the shelf. Let's go to Staples or, you know, Office Depot and you just buy off the shelf and great. It's a great product, right? Um, whereas the platform was being able to scale, right? I, and I can build my own. I can use the platform and I can build some platform. Uh, it's all these modules that are there, like the distribution module, financial accounting, project accounting, CRM. Um, that's all built on the platform. And then in certain areas, you might not have certain functionality, right? Now you have an option to customize in the sense you can take it because you have the intellectual property or you know the problem, the definition of a problem, and you know the solution. And now you're going to build some custom screens or custom logical expressions, um, what to do, how to do, when to do, right? So when you do that, it's a customization. Now you can actually put that as a separate package in Acumatica and manage those package and be able to deploy that, which works great for your company. Uh, so when that is the need, then customization is what we would call it. Now, when you take that same requirement and the same problem, if some other customer is experiencing the same problem uh, and it's kind of an industry problem, then all of a sudden the definition can be changed. Take that same requirement and the same problem. If some other customer is experiencing the same problem, uh, and it's kind of an industry problem, then all of a sudden the definition can be changed from customization and you make it as an, and package it as a plugin. So at that point it becomes a plugin. That means you can, you can adapt or you can uh, take this uh, plugin and be able to deploy it on different instances. So if you want to do it um, where you want to deploy on different instances of uh, customers instances, then it's, a, it's termed as a plugin. Um, so that's the differentiation between a customization and a plugin is customization is one off and it could be specific to very specific to this customer. Uh, but if that same problem reoccurs and can be reapplied, then all of a sudden 
you know, you should start thinking it as a plugin, uh, at which point you may have to think a little bit more about how do I generalize it? Uh, how do I make it in such a way that it works for customer A? Uh, little bit of knowledge and information that you have to think ahead of time to make it a plugin because it's generic and it could be used. So that's the differentiation between a plugin and a customization. So from a technical perspective, it's still deployed the same way as what's called a customization project inside of Acumatica. That's but right. the differentiation you're making between customization and plugin has more to do with how you think about it and how you support it, whether it's just for a specific client or whether you're supporting a, a generic solution across multiple clients. Absolutely. No, that's absolutely true. Yes. So from the technical, functional, the intellectual property, all of that is the same. Uh, how you deploy it, how you build it, and how you deploy it uh, is pretty much the same in Acumatica. But it's just that how you support it and how you enhance it, and it becomes like your baby to, to uh, build those plugins. Uh, to compare that with, let's say, you know, iPhone, right? I idea at that point in time, and let's say, and some other app developers start to use the platform of Android or iOS platforms and build the apps for those smartphones. So, so consider app as a plugin equivalent in the ERP world for Acumatica. So I know you've done a number of plugins and it sounds like in the beginning you started off just implementing Acumatica and doing probably customizations for specific clients. Right. At what point did you turn the corner into plugins and maybe what was that first plugin and what made you excited enough about it to say, hey, I want to actually support this as a plugin and not a one-off customization? Yep. So I think uh, that's that's was our experience wherein we were implementing Acumatica for our customers. And as we are implementing, obviously, one size does not fit all, right? So uh, there will be always a you know, 10 to 20 percent that we were implementing Acumatica for our customers. And as we are implementing, obviously, one size does not fit all, right? So uh, there will be always a you know, 10 to 20 percent that somebody does a bit different. And that could be termed as a customization, things that you can add. Like obviously you can add custom fields and whatnot. So that's not really the uh, problem. The thing could be like, maybe I do a bit different. The way I do sales codes versus how I do my shipping or how I do my integration with something could be different and that could be customization. So as we are implementing, uh, the first one that we rolled out, um, we had two of them going at the same time, but the first one that we rolled out was the e-signature plugin. Uh, which is being able to accept digital signatures, electronic signatures within Acumatica. So that's something we rolled out uh, late 2016, uh, wherein you can now accept signatures uh, on sales orders, on, on sales invoices screen. Um, and I definitely that's one of the fastest selling plugins for us because it's, uh, it does the job of collecting the signature from a customer uh, it, it could be uh, it could be used as a proof of shipment. So if you have a fleet of uh, drivers driving around and dropping off things, and they need to collect signatures, just like how UPS does, um, when they hand off the shipment, then they take signature from you. So that capability we built with Acumatica, where on a shipment screen you can accept signatures, and it's a proof of um, you know, shipment as well as uh, it, it does help you with the consent that you know you delivered and they received it. Um, I'm curious on that one. Um, you know, there's DocuSign and Adobe Sign, which are more about sending signatures through email. Right. I think your product is more about having someone actually sign it right there on the spot. Right. I'm curious, where, where do you find people do it most? Is it a phone? Is it a tablet? Is it some signature specific device? Phone? Is it a tablet? Is it some signature specific device? Good question. How do you see yeah. I mean, once we introduced, I think DocuSign integration came up probably a year. We kind of had the solution before that was done. And the DocuSign concept works on a document more of a, like a proposal or, you know, you know, landlord agreement or whatnot, right? So on a one-off document. Um, so that's good if you're doing that kind of a business. But if you're doing more of a distribution and you're, you're shipping things every single day um, and then uh, in, when you want to accept signature, then it becomes a transactional uh, document. So the key difference between DocuSign and, and e-signature plugin that we have is, you know, we, we charge it by based on the yearly subscription. So 
whether you do 100 documents, sales orders, 100 sales orders, or 100 sales invoices, or 100 shipments, or when you do 1,000, it's really up to you, right? Uh, so we don't go by the transactional document uh, charges. We just go by a yearly subscription, and that's a huge differentiating factor um, where customers see the value in our plugin, right? So that's the key thing. Um, and then to that specific, um, you know, file system of, of the document, whether it's a sales order or sales invoice or opportunity screens, uh, in the current version that we have in the e-signature, now we accept signature across seven or eight documents. Um, and then we can scale that now. So anywhere with Nekimatica, we can accept signature in the system. Uh, most people use, um, depending on where the usage is, right? Um, if it's a, uh, you know, truck delivery or, or drivers dropping off things, then they use Android devices, uh, like a tablet, like a seven inch tablet, uh, just big enough for you to carry and big enough for you to show it to the customer and be able to accept signature. Uh, so definitely not the smartphone because that's that's something smaller in size and we, you know, obviously they would shy away from that, but Android tablets have helped us. If it is somebody who's coming to the office and um, accepting signatures and taking the shipment, uh, then uh, people use the laptop um, in a touch touch screen, um, in a touch touch screen to sign on it. Or they also use, uh, which we support by the way, is the electronic signature pad. Uh, so we do have integration with the hardware interface. Um, so if you, you know, if you buy that particular uh, model that we we support, then you can plug that right into your desktop or laptop that you have in the office, and be able to provide that to the customer to sign on the signature pad directly and we capture that signature into Acumatica. So we have that interface also for those who are going to walk in and be able to sign on something. Okay. Note on that, I was at a hotel a few nights ago and they, I think this is more and more common for the signature. They had a, a, um, a thing of clean pens and a thing of used pens <laughs> with COVID, right? So I'm right. sure even with electronic signatures, that's a consideration nowadays, but eventually we'll get back to more, I'm sure that's a consideration nowadays, but eventually we'll get back to more and more of that, that in-person, especially to your point, when you're dealing with distribution, you're still dealing with physical shipments. And so mm -hmm. there's still a need for that in-person verification. That's, it's not going to go away with physical goods. Right. That makes a lot of sense to be able to have that option, not just the uh, do signature via email option. Right. I mean, again, and also everything is moving towards cloud and everything is moving towards electronic. And obviously uh, people would like to collect signatures uh, and be able to electronically sign, especially with COVID, everything's become electronically signed. You know, people now don't want to accept any checks. They want to do more ACH, right? <laughs> Our credit card. So, uh, so definitely there is uh, you know, opportunity for us to sell this more. Uh, there are a lot of partners we sell through partners. We, are, we sell it through direct. Um, so definitely that's something if people want to accept signatures, um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just use the, you have to reinvent the wheel. You can just use the, the plugin that we already built uh, and it's been used last four years now, right? Three to four years. And uh, across uh, US as well as we have a couple of clients in South Africa that are using it. So uh, we know that works <laughs> outside of US as well. <laughs> so. Well, that's awesome. I, I know we want to walk through a number of your other plugins as well, but I think it's great that the first one you yeah. you went for mm -hmm. is is still doing well for you. So that's that's a right. great sign for your other plugins as well. Yeah, so that's, that's why we kind of started out with another one called the print shop. And that was actually, uh, this is where the line, thin line was. Uh, we customized it to begin with, right? We were implementing it for a, a, a client of ours called uh, Kevin's Worldwide. Uh, and they are more into screen printing, promotional product company, right? Uh, as we were going through it and we're like, what do you do all this paperwork? and we could automate this and we can do it within the Acumatica because of the plan, because of the technology challenges we had. And uh, we finally finished the project, they went live. And then I turned around and saw, well, guess what? There could be companies like this, which could also make use of the, the solution that we built. And that's where we kind of turned it around and made it a plugin and call it Print Shop. Meanwhile, we had done the e-signature. So we learned some experience of how to do it as a plugin within Acumatica. And then as we went towards uh, creating our first uh, full-fledged print shop plugin, uh, which is primarily for print um, distribution companies, promotional product industry companies. 
anybody who prints something on paper or on apparel or on, on any any material then they all go through what's called the art approval process where they're printing some art or they're printing something on something right if that's needed then they go through a job production kind of a facility where you know a lot of people touching the same job and doing certain activity uh, so there has to be some kind of uh, so there has to be some kind of uh, managing that, being able to see the status of the job as to where, where the job is and who, who's working on it and what status of it. So, so PrintShop really automates this whole job production as well as the art approval process within Acumatica uh, and gives you the clarity as to what type of job you're working on, who's working on it, whether it's screen printing, whether it's embroidery, whether it is uh, digital, uh, or whether it is promotional products. So we kind of cover all those and we were able to now expand that into different areas where uh, print distribution companies could also benefit from this uh, software, uh, from this plugin rather. So this plugin again sits on a distribution module uh, on a sales order screen. So uh, it kind of takes the bulk uh, in terms of being able to manage the job. Uh, there is a possibility we can integrate this to also uh, manufacturing edition. Uh, so where if somebody wants to do job tracking and be able to track uh, time and material, want to do job tracking and be able to track uh, time and material and resources utilized, then uh, the manufacturing uh, module really does a good job. And we can actually tie that to, uh, to that to that extent where it really ties um, uh, into your job costing and be able to recognize uh, your profit right away as you complete that invoice. So correct me if I'm wrong, but that sounds like a, a much more significant developer effort than the e-signature plugin. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, the print shop was a much more heavy lift um, than the e-signature plugin. Uh, of course, it, it, it does affect your sales process. It affects the purchasing process. Uh, so we tie into those two. We also expose this in the opportunities in the CRM module. Uh, so the one, the one that we're working right now is I, we are now enabling the ability to art approve through the customer portal. So we're trying that and we bring that experience of the customer user experience day in and day out. And you have salespeople using opportunities, creating CRM opportunities or creating sales scores, uh, and then interacting with your customer. Any interaction that you do, you record that information as activities and files and art. And then you pass it on to your art department and they work on the art and they will send it out to the customer to approve. Right now, we have the ability to send out as a PDF file via email and get the approval done. Now we want to take that, what we learned, and we want to automate that process and open up the customer portal and show the value of the self-service portal where they can come in, look at the art and then say, yeah, I like this art or I can decline it or I can approve it. And it's all electronic, right? Uh, if you want to put our signature on top of that, sure, we can add that on, on this customer portal. So you have actually not only the customers approved and hit submit button, but they can also sign on it. So everything can tie into the system and automates the process. And then it comes to the job production. You know, we have had quite a lot of features here. You have actually not only the customers approved and hit submit button, but they can also sign on it. So everything can tie into the system and automates the process. And then it comes to the job production. You know, we have had quite a lot of features here where you can create now multiple job cards and you can assign it to each line. For instance, I might be doing a screen print on a t-shirt, Nike t-shirt, medium, 20, 20 quantities. I can assign a job card. And the next one could be because I'm having a golf event and the next one could be I'm doing a polo shirts with the embroidered logo on it. Uh, and then I might be doing a hat uh, and I may be doing some golf balls and when I want to put a chromatic logo on it, sure, you can do that. So you can create multiple job cards and be able to assign them and manage and track everything that's happening. Uh, some of them are normal PO, some and most of them are uh, are, are on demand basis. So we tie that to the purchasing process. Uh, some could be drop shipped because some promotional products, most of them get drop shipped. So you can really track and use what a client we are consuming that in the print shop and showing people how they can use uh, Acumatica to the fullest extent with the help of the plugin. So, so that's, that's something very niche, very specific to print uh, businesses. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I've got a kind of a side sideball or side curve question related to that. And that is, you know, now that you're at this point, you're getting into uh, more of a heavy duty type of solution. I'm curious what your experience has been. Maybe let's just say the last two to three years 
where Acumatic has now fallen into the cycle of an R1 and an R2 release. Those are the two major releases every year. We all know there's always a ton of new stuff that comes out with each new release, R1 or R2. But then in between there, there's these, these builds within a release that come out maybe every two, four, six weeks and port a plugin on top of that. How, how often have you found that when you're within a release, and you're just upgrading to a new build, how often has that caused a problem for you? And I guess the, the reason why I'm asking the question is, I think one thing a lot of customers still struggle with is how often do they just apply a build uh, and how much testing do they need to do when they apply a build? They know when they upgrade to a new version, like an R, new R1 or a new R2, they gotta treat that like a full on upgrade. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm curious how much in your experience, build to build, are you treating it as an upgrade versus not much uh, impacts your product? Right. Um, so my experience that I've seen, um, has it broken? Uh, yes. Uh, has it broken badly? No. <laughs> um, does it break quite often? Not really. Uh, but it has broken in certain areas, like maybe in the opportunity, they change few things. <laughs> um, does it break quite often? Not really. Uh, but it has broken in certain areas, like maybe in the opportunity, they change few things, um, the fields, and that has broken. Uh, so we were able to fix that. In the purchasing process, there was some issue or some enhancement done that was broken, and we were able to catch up with it. Um, so, uh, I mean, even though there is release notes, there are a lot of good things that Acumatic puts out. Uh, in practical sense, you know, you know, you won't go through it 100% and, and try to map it saying, oh, this is what's going to affect my solution. But we, this is what I believe. I like the concept of R1 and R2, maybe a little bit of a, of a push, trying to do two, you know, releases in a year and expecting all customers to switch to it uh, may not be practical. Theoretically, is great. Um, but then it becomes a stress for plugin developers, right? Now you have to test every six. Um, so you're adding new features. Uh, so on top of that, you're testing and all of a sudden R2 is here. So you have to be compatible with that version uh, and make sure that works. Um, so what we have to taken a stand is we always want to keep our plugins ready, especially the bigger ones like the print shop and the jewel shop. Those we want to check and make sure it works only on R2 or rather we tell our clients upgrade to R2 because R2 I've felt is the most stable and most complete version. Uh, in R1, you might have a feature that's introduced, but it may not be a rock solid. And then by R2, it gets really rock solid. And so that's what I've kind of seen my experience. And I tell people that would be good timing uh, to switch over. Um, so definitely there is, uh, if there is a, a uh, necessity, for instance, example, for print shop customers, let's say they had to do some kind of testing. Uh, so we do have a setup sandbox. <clears throat> we have testing. Uh, so we do have a setup sandbox. <clears throat> we have uh, their team, uh, you know, use their data and do some testing. Uh, so I, we involve the salespeople, we involve the purchasing people, uh, those teams to test. Um, literally basically tell them that, you know, just do what you're doing, which is create sales orders, act like this is a real one and create a purchase order, you know, let the purchasing team take it over and let them just say, yeah, I received it and just run through the reports and, and, and the whole steps, right? We have the 10 steps or 20 steps that people have to touch um, and make sure nothing breaks uh, and no surprises uh, as you go live. So that's how we are kind of um, interacting with our clients and testing it. So there is um, to some degree, um, you know, customers are involved uh, when we upgrade once a year. So uh, that's also a good thing because now um, you can see new features that Actomatica itself has introduced uh, in new automations, uh, like for example, business events or any other things that are comes now, um, you can see new features that Actomatica itself has introduced uh, in new automations, uh, like for example, business events or any other things that are coming in. You get the time to learn and see uh, and then how we can also make use of that in the print shop itself and say, hey, you know what, here's a better way of doing it. So it's a, it's a constant um, usage of time in terms of development and testing. So definitely customer needs to um, kind of reserve at least, you know, maybe five to 10 hours uh, in every upgrade uh, just to get themselves, uh, 
in terms of learning the new product and the new features and then uh, making sure that nothing is going to break when they go live. So that's definitely a must. That's great advice. Appreciate that. Um, so you, you mentioned e-signature, you mentioned print shop, and I heard you slip in there jewel shop right. for a second there. I'll let you go ahead and talk about jewel <laughs> shop then. <laughs> yeah. so that's another uh, aspect. They happen to be in the jewelry business and uh, they want to do customization. And as we spoke more and more, uh, I said, this is a customization, it's a heavy lift uh, in terms of customizations, what you're trying to do, because it, it, Acumatica was not meant to be for a jewelry business. Um, you know, it, it does the job more or less 60%, 70%, but you know, it's all about uh, naming convention, like how do you name it, right? Or how do you call it? Um, what we learned quickly was they don't call inventory a SKU, right? They don't, in their business terminology, it is a style. Um, so this is a new style of, of earrings. This is a new style of, uh, you know, bracelets. So a style is, is what for them is inventory item, right? So, uh, so we kind of learned that then that's one of the example where I kind of said, you know, instead of doing a customization, I would rather turn this into a plugin. So right there, more or less, it's the same concept. So that's how we kind of, um, from get go, we said it's going to be a plugin and, it, and the benefits of, of being a plugin. Uh, so the customers kind of signed on and uh, we were able to build Jewel Shop. And I would say Jewel Shop was one step higher than the print shop because we did quite a lot of automation in the, uh, in the jewelry for jewelry business. So we utilized attributes to good extent, being able to search by attributes, being able to narrow it down and say, yes, I have uh, earring made up of this and in gold in 14K carats versus 18K versus, um, uh, you know, if I wanted to have a diamond on top of that and whatnot, I can start filtering the record all the way to that one specific earring that I have that the customer was looking for and be able to turn around and say, yeah, we have that in stock, uh, how we can get that done for you. So, so that's what we understood how people buy in the jewelry business and how the earring that I have that the customer was looking for and be able to turn around and say, yeah, we have that in stock, uh, how we can get that done for you. So, so that's what we understood how people buy in the jewelry business and how they do transaction. Uh, it may not resonate with Acumatica's way of doing things. So that's where the jewelry shop really um, was able to kind of add those features like the smart search, uh, being able to do consignment, memo in, memo out. Uh, that's something uh, very much every jeweler does is a consignment memo out. They send out this jewelry to another, another person and try to see if they can sell it for them. Uh, so it happens quite often. So that's where uh, Jewel Shop was the third plugin that we came out. We launched it uh, early 2019. Uh, so we have two customers who are using that and, and that they're super happy because it speaks their language. It's, it, it is meant for their business. I'm curious when you mentioned consignment there in Jewel Shop as a customization and then move to a plugin, do you find that sometimes you move backwards? Like you might have someone with a specific consignment need that's not in the jewelry business. Do you then maybe take what you've built in Jewel Shop and pull some of that out and do a specific customization for a client? Right. Yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard another area, another industry, which um, does good amount of consignment goods is the rugs when you, when the carpet industry, rugs and carpet, where they do bring in the carpets from you know, Iran or you know, India or other places. And then they may say, yeah, I have this carpet and they can, they can memo consign it out uh, to another, not to another distribution company and then try to sell it through them. So, so anybody who wants to use in that aspect, we can definitely, uh, we can definitely detach just the consignment module and then be able to um, make it as a separate customization with a uh, jewel shop wherein uh, you can, instead of using the barcode scanning, you know, I actually ran into uh, this provider uh, at, a, at a trade show, uh, jewelry trade show, and they were using RFID, and, but they didn't use it the ERP system. Uh, so I was like, well, we have the ERP and we have the jewel shop, but we don't have the RFID. So we kind of, you know, hand shook and uh, we were able to integrate their RFID system into Acumatica. So now, you know, I would say this is that's an amazing technology, Tim. Like you turn on the uh, wave connector, like the hardware device, and you just hit scan, 
and it'll scan like hundreds of inventory items. Think about it, you have like 50 um, jewelry uh, for let's say uh, earrings and then you have 50 bracelets and you have 50 other products. Instead of sitting there and scanning each barcode, with this wave connector, you can just scan in within a few seconds, 10 seconds, all your hundreds of products are listing in the, in the system. You have 50 bracelets and you have 50 other products. Instead of sitting there and scanning each barcode with this wave connector, you can just scan in within a few seconds, 10 seconds, all your hundreds of products are listing in the, in the system. And it will show you that you want this to add to the grid and you can add to the sales order, you're ready to check out. So, so the RFID is really uh, uh, promising uh, when it comes to doing transaction um, and being able to track and, and, and figure out where your products are. So that's something which we integrated. And I had another uh, partner who reached out to us and said, hey, can we just use RFID and not for jewel shop uh, for another uh, customer who, who needs RFID tags. So that, that was one example where we said, well, we sure we could do that. And we were able to kind of uh, identify which areas we need to plug that module if, if required. Yeah. Interesting. I, I'm curious on RFIDs. I mean, I've read a best, I would imagine. Like, <laughs> what, I would assume you wouldn't put these things on, on small, tiny uh, things that aren't worth very much money. I, I would assume there's a certain point at which Right. It makes sense cost-wise. There's yeah. your take on that. At what point, if I'm uh, I'm a distributor oh, or or I, I hold some type of inventory, yeah. uh, what per unit? What does that stuff have to be worth for RFID to, to make sense? Right. So I would say it's it really is RFID is important for let's say if your product, the material that you are selling, um, is of a, a high value, right? When I say high value, it could be like a you know, jewelry that you're selling, that's high, high value. Uh, and it's labor intense, right? How much would you pay for a labor to tag all the barcodes? Uh, $10 per hour, right? And then you have thousand products and how much would you spend the time there? And you wanna go to the next trade show and you wanna re-tag re it again. So then how much would you spend that? Trade show and you wanna re-tag re it again. So then how much would you spend that? So that that is involved. And then the cost also with RFID is there are two types of it, which are active and a passive. Um, so passive ones are sleeping all the time and you can wake them up with the, uh, with the signal and, and then say, who are you? And it'll respond back and say, I'm so and so. And that's how you know it is active uh, at that point. Whereas the active RFID is always constantly beeping and, and giving you signals back. And that, those are a little expensive. But for what we have done in, in, in Jewel Shop is for passive ones. And it's like just like a sticker, right? Uh, it's already embedded. The code is embedded on it as it prints. It's just like a barcode. Uh, as you as you printing itself, it already got the RFID number, a auto-generated number to it, and you tag that along to this devices or any products that you want to sell. Um, I think the break-even would be, you know, the the market is also, you know, drastically changing in terms of the pricing. There are now more drastically changing in terms of the pricing. There are now more RFID providers out uh, out there who are ready to sell the uh, RFID tags. Um, and it's all about the devices and the implementation part of it. So, but the, the, the turnover is probably is, if you look at what is the time spent mm -hmm. in re-tagging and scanning and how much productivity you're gonna gain by you know having all of the RFID tags built in. So that's the, I don't, I may not have the exact stats as to what the break-even point is, but uh, definitely I, my thumb of uh, rule here is, if you're a company and you have certain products which are precious uh, goods, uh, whether it's jewelry, whether it's lens, uh, or whether it is uh, any other product that you think is worth transmitting, uh, or worth, uh, for instance, if it's a bigger equipment, you know, which you cannot lift and do things. So then you can just put the RFID on once on it, that way you are all you have to do just use a scan gun and just scan it, and, and you're able to scan that through. So those are the things that will help you. It helps you also in, uh, if you want to do a physical inventory count, you have a big warehouse and you have thousands of products. Think about closing the where, whole warehouse and trying to do a physical count one or two days. Uh, instead with the RFID, if you are all done with RFID, then it'll probably take an hour or two to scan everything and get a physical count. So the benefits are more and somebody has to evaluate and see what the company does and how they do business and then say, here is the uh, you know, cost of, of 
implementing an RFID for you and what are the benefits of it and what's the break you want. Make sense? Yeah, no, that's cool. And as you mentioned, the cost is always coming down like with all technologies. So I'm sure that price point is right. continue to get lower and lower for it to make sense. Yeah. So you that started off with like, we go small, medium, large in terms of complexity. All print shop, maybe medium, jewel shop, large. And you've also got a newer one uh, that I always forget if you call it address validation, I think is what you're calling it, or yes. address verification. And that we maybe go back down to a smaller complexity, but something that a lot of people need. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that plugin. Right. The fourth one that, that we did was the address validation plugin, right? And um, again, this was something we. Uh, at least I, I had this idea of doing this within Acumatica and I tried it um, during a hackathon uh, with the USPS. Uh, but then when we're sitting down uh, and evaluating what kind of project should we do for hackathon, we kind of said maybe not appealing and we went with another solution. <laughs> so uh, so that was there in my in my mind that it, we need address validation kind of built into Acumatica. Uh, it, it's not that it's not there. Avalara has an integration in my in my mind that it we need address validation kind of built into Acumatica. Uh, it, it's not that it's not there. Avalara has an integration, but in order for it to use Avalara, you need to use Avalara sales tax, uh, the, the tax. So until then, if you don't have that, then you cannot use address validation. So that was kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of a stop like for us, for most of the customers. So I was thinking of doing the USPS one and then really didn't have the time. Uh, so then, during COVID, uh, when it happened, and you know, as, as pretty much everyone was in shock, and nobody was buying, and nobody was doing much work, uh, we kind of took the time and said, you know what? Uh, and I had one customer just before that ask me for integration uh, with the USPS, and this is where I it kind of sparked me and said, you know what? Maybe we should do it now as a plugin, because this is something. It's a generic plugin that is uh, applicable for all customers of Acumatica, and that's where because now you have to generate a, a token ID, you gotta get a, uh, you know, registration keys or API keys, bring that in, plug that information in Acumatica and validate and do all that stuff. Um, since it's a cloud solution, whatever we're going to do has to be a cloud uh, enabled so that you can scale your business. Today, you might have a customer who have 5,000 addresses that they wanna clean versus somebody who might come in and say, I got 500,000 or 5 million addresses. Uh, can you scale? Uh, and I'll tell you this, if you have USPS, then they have a limit. At some point, you'll have to call in and, and ask for exception and you have to, you have to deal with that. Uh, so that's not how a cloud solution really works, right? So if you want to scale, you can scale just like how Acumatica scales its uh, resources. You could scale the same solution uh, with our address validation plugin. So that's the concept where we built the address validation plugin. And I think uh, last month, uh, in June, in June, we launched in, which is available for 2019 R2 and 2020 R1. Now, I, I did see in the pre-release notes for 2020 R2 that there's some type of address validation right. functionality there. I don't know if you've looked at that yet and compared to what Absolutely. your plugin is offering. Yeah. When I when I started doing the plugin, um, I reached I reached out to Acumatica and I said, hey, by the way, we're trying to do this plugin, you know. And <laughs> that's when I came to know that, oh, we, we may be adding that kind of feature in the product. <laughs> so I was like, oh, darn, okay. But then, story, I think that story has been told by many ISVs in the Acumatica ecosystem. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, we weren't taken back by that, but then uh, we knew where we were heading with and we knew what Acumatica is adding. Uh, so they're using the Google and the Bing Maps and uh, API. Uh, so and Google is stepping into the uh, into this adding. Uh, so they're using the Google and the Bing Maps and uh, API. Uh, so and Google is stepping into the uh, into this address thing quite a lot because they could be used in different aspects of it. Um, so the address API is one API that Google now provides. Um, so again, they don't do all of it. Uh, and but but in a sense they may do it for free to a certain extent and free can only take you so far right so i don't know how far that is you know, that the feature that's built in acumatica uh, but with uh, with our services 
um, again, it's all based on the address, number of addresses that you want us to validate. Um, and then you can buy yearly subscription pack of 5,000 or 10,000 or 50,000. So we make that agreement and then you know, you're ready to scan and you're ready to uh, validate your addresses and, and be able to uh, do your shipments. Uh, primarily, it's going to help customers who, uh, who might ship to a wrong address. And then realize that you could just spend 10 cents or five cents uh, and clean and validate your address ahead of time, right? And then our services, when we validate, we give you the geo code. That means you get the longitude and latitude, exact pinpoint to the place where you're sitting, right? Where your house is, or where, your, where your business uh, location is. So that's really useful and valuable. Um, getting the geo codes is the most important part of it and validating getting the right address ahead of time. And we validate on different you know, addresses, whether it's contact, billing, shipping. Uh, we also take it one step further. We do it on the sales order as well. So maybe there's an existing sales order and uh, you now wanna ship it and you wanna give a different shipping address at that point in time, uh, overwrite shipping addresses and you can take that information and you can validate right there on the sales order. That's, so that, that means before it goes to shipping, our shipment screen, you have validated that address and you know for sure that it can reach the customer. Now, for some reason, now for some reason, uh, if you, when we validate, we get the error codes, which is also called the result codes, and we show that and say, you know what, if this error code is so and so, I wouldn't recommend you shipping. So we, we wouldn't even let you go forward. So now it's up to you if you still want to ship it, but we, as an address validation plugin, take that. And from our experience, we know this is not going to happen. Um, so those are the things that we bring to the system. And then the latest feature that we just added was the processing screen. So if somebody wanted to process 5,000 bulk addresses that are existing addresses, they can do that using our uh, address validation plugin. So that's a new thing that you can do. So that really helps customers, those who are going live with it, they can clean their existing addresses and keep it clean. And then if they will also import, let's say if somebody comes from a trade show and they have like thousand leads and with addresses, then they can import the leads and then after which they can then clean the addresses uh, with our process and they can import the leads and then after which they can then clean the addresses uh, with our processing screen quickly. So, so those are the value that you know, one can bring uh, by creating such plugins. Uh, and I'm happy that Archimedica is introducing that address validation um, within the system for all users. Um, but then depending on the usage, a customer has a choice now if they want to use address validation plugin uh, because their business is a bit different than other customers, then they can do so. So that's the, um, uh, I would say, upbeat of why we should still be in the marketplace and list it, uh, which we just recently did. Um, so there's definitely uh, some customers who are going to use it. Um, we have a couple of customers already using it now. So that is the challenge that you will have with uh, ISV as an ISV and uh, as a vendor, uh, there is a possibility that Acumatica can add a feature that uh, almost take that Acumatica can add a feature that uh, almost take may take out your plugin. So you have to constantly evolve and constantly keep adding value to your plugins uh, and to the ecosystem. And I totally agree with you. One situation I think of is the integration with UPS and FedEx to get tracking numbers, shipping labels. That's been there for years. But when you go to implement that, UPS and FedEx, they look at you like you're a software developer. And like you said, you have to then go get developer keys and you got to set up these test accounts and then prove it's working with them. And then they flip it over to production. And there's a big process for that. And you've set it up as a cloud service. So it just works. You don't have to deal with that. And then also your pace of innovation. I've already seen you add it to additional screens when we requested. You just added the bulk processing screen. Uh, and just, yeah, yeah I totally I mean, agree. Uh, <laughs> I like it. Yeah, it's uh, very fine tuned and uh, I'm constantly listening and constantly adding values and features to this. Um, at this validation or any other plugins that we do. Uh, and I think it's a good thing because now the customer has a choice to use out of the box uh, and or if you want advanced level of doing things, uh, you know, the service provider that we use does a lot of address matching. They have fuzzy logic matching, few other addresses that they match. So they are the, you know, the, the pioneers in address validation. 
uh, even before, you know, everybody is using the same data, Google, Bing, and everyone else, but these guys have gotten a master data. So uh, I'd rather work with somebody who has the master data and not, not uh, reuse it. So, <laughs> so that's where I see the value. Uh, and then once you're geocoded, uh, we, we did another project for another client where we took all those addresses and were able to map it on Google right away. And those addresses and were able to map it on Google right away. And that's something you can see inside of Acumatic. You don't have to Google, go to Google Maps or anywhere, but you're inside Acumatic and you click on, you know, you know sales, sales map, and it shows all the sales that this, you as a salesperson did with your customers on the map. So if you are a road salesman and you want to go visit somebody in Atlanta and, and you bring up this map, it shows you all the cust- of your customers that bought in the last six months and the dollar value on based on the dollar value, it shows you the different colors green, red, blue, and then you can click on it and you can say, well, I'm going to go visit this customer and see what they're doing. So if you want to do something of that sort, then the geocoding is really important. Uh, you can also be used that for dealer locator. If you want to locate dealers, uh, if you want to locate certain stores, then all of this plays very well once you have your address validated and are geocoded. Okay. Yeah, that, the analysis. Geocoded. Okay. Yeah, that the analysis side of that and then getting into business intelligence to me is where that starts to get really interesting and really valuable. Right. To be able to get that kind of insight. Very yeah. cool. Well, Harsha, I'm looking at the clock. The time has just flown by. I know we might have had some other things we want to hit as well, but hopefully um, um, you were able to describe your plugins to the level of detail that you wanted to. Maybe we could do another podcast episode in the future. It sounds like you've got a lot of cool stuff going on. Yeah. Thanks. Now I appreciate um, taking the time to, you know, do this podcast. And uh, as I always said, uh, uh, it's, it's important for us to communicate and share information. Uh, and uh, your ag forums really does a good job of bringing people together. Um, and again, as I said, uh, and you realize this, which is even Acumatica has a new forum that's coming up. So, and share with um, your users. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot and stay safe and enjoy the California weather. Thank you. (laughs) All right. Well, that's it for now. We'll catch you on the next episode of AUG Forum. Thanks for listening and take care. Thanks for listening and take care.